Hi, everybody. My name is Jamie Dougherty. I'm the residential horticulture agent and master garden coordinator here at the University of Florida IFAS Lake County Extension Office. And today I am joined by Dr. Malcolm Manners for a talk about how to grow roses in Florida. So a little bit about Malcolm. Um, so Dr. Malcolm Manners is a professor of horticultural science at Florida Southern College, where he teaches courses in general horticulture, tropical fruit, horticultural pests and diseases, plant physiology, and plant nutrition. Since 1984, he has managed Florida Southern College's Rose, Rose Mosaic Virus Heat Therapy Program, which cures roses of virus diseases and makes the healthy propagating material available to the nursery industry. In conjunction with that program, he manages a collection of approximately 400 rose varieties um, in two college um, gardens and the college greenhouse. Most of the certified mosaic virus-free ro old rose gardens now grown in the U.S. came through the Florida Southern program. In 1990, he imported a collection of Bermuda's mystery roses, um, and it is from Florida Southern College's stock that much of the U.S. stock of these roses has been propagated. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Manners. We will be holding questions till the end. I will be monitoring questions as we go as well. Well, thank you, Jamie. Um, let me, can I pin myself? How does this work? There we go. Hi, folks. Um, it's nice to be with you this evening. And um, I'm gonna use a, a PowerPoint here. So let me share this screen here, get that going. As Jamie said, I, I teach at Florida Southern College, which is Lakeland, just a few miles down the road from you. And um, Florida Southern is known for its Frank Lloyd Wright architecture but it's also become kind of known for our roses. We're a four-year uh, liberal, pri private liberal arts college associated with the Methodist Church. We offer a Bachelor of Science degree. We have in our Department of Horticultural Science, uh, mainly citrus production, but also some general horticulture. And we use our rose gardens and our greenhouses in our teaching program. We don't specifically teach courses on growing roses, but they're a nice, um, tool to use in teaching general horticulture. And so they're used a lot in that way. And the campus has twice been named the most beautiful campus in America. And I like to think that our roses helped with that. We do have two gardens. This is the Jane Elizabeth Jenkins Rose Garden, which has 60 plants with nine varieties. Um, we have specialized there in all red and white roses because those are Florida Southern's official school colors. And then we have Ruth's Rose Garden, which has a little over 300 plants of somewhat more than 200 varieties of lots of different types and different colors. So it's more of a hodgepodge. This was right after we planted it, by the way. And then this is after it had become somewhat more mature. It's a lot bigger than that now. Some of you probably already grow roses and, you, and if you've grew, grown roses in the north and now you're growing them in Florida, you probably realize that Florida is not the easiest place to grow good roses, but you can grow good roses. And unlike places in the north, you can have them flowering right now. So we have some advantages, even though there are challenges. The big challenges, uh, the first one is probably black spot disease, which is a fungus disease. Uh, anytime you're having warm weather, and the humidity is high enough that you get dew at night, you're gonna have black spot on susceptible varieties. And so we have to deal with that. This time of year, when we're getting more chilly nights and warmer days, uh, we can also get powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is not usually a devastating disease in the garden in central Florida, as it is in some other parts of the world, but it can cause some problems on very susceptible varieties. The way to control those, uh, probably the single best way is to try to grow varieties that are known to be resistant. And there are lots of varieties that are resistant to mildew. Unfortunately, you're more limited if you're looking for, for strong resistance to black spot. There aren't as many that are resistant. Um, culturally, you can uh, avoid long periods of wetting the foliage. So 
if you use overhead irrigation in your rose garden and you run it in the evening or at night, that's probably not a good idea. It's better to keep those leaves as dry as possible for as long as possible during the day. And then for some types, you may have to spray them if you're going to grow them. And, and some people who are very much opposed to spraying simply will choose their varieties based on that. But some varieties, I, I don't think you could grow successfully in our climate without some spraying of fungicides. The other big problem that we have that is just recent, I'm assuming you have it in your area just as we do, is chili thrips, which are a small uh, insect pest that feeds on the leaves and the stems. This staining on the stem is a problem. They're a, a really devastating problem that 10 years ago, it was so much easier to grow roses without them, but now we have them. But control can be really difficult because they attack a lot of other plants. And so if you kill them in your garden, they just come right back. One of the um, real, really unfortunate things that we've discovered in roses is there seems to be, I don't know if it's a true genetic link or if it's just bad luck, but some of the most disease resistant roses are some of the most susceptible to thrips. So for many years, people planted the knockout rose and, it's, and there, there's pink knockout and yellow knockout, there's a whole knockout series because they have extreme resistance to black spot. But chili thrips just love them and they'll kill them to the ground if you let them. And the same is true of Belinda's Dream, a really wonderful uh, hybrid tea looking shrub that, that uh, big pink flowers that just almost never has a black spot problem. Chili thrips can just devastate that plant. So that's unfortunate. Um, I don't know of a lot of roses that are really resistant to chili thrips. So we do grow one from Bermuda called Smith's Parish that is completely fine but I don't know of another rose in our collection that doesn't show some damage. Now, some roses will survive it and probably be okay, but they're not as nice as they would be with, without it. In our gardens, we do use insecticides as we need, need to. So we do soil applied imidacloprid, uh, and then this, we have a spray service that sprays for fun, fungi in the garden. And um, when, when we see chili thrips, they, they alternate between various classes of insecticides. That's another challenge with chili thrips as it is with any pest. They will build resistance if you use the same insecticide over and over. When I planted our gardens, I, I offered to choose varieties that would be highly disease resistant. This was in the days before chili thrips, so we wouldn't have to spray. But the college administration decided they wanted more variety. And so they said, we'll pay for the spraying. And so my gardens are sprayed. Another problem that we have with growing roses long-term in Florida is that we have very light, sandy soils in much of the peninsula. Some places are lucky enough to have some clay, but here in Lakeland, we don't have much of it. And also we tend to have a lot of nematodes in our soil, various types of nematodes. And, and a lot of roses just don't do well under those conditions. And so by grafting a rose onto a resistant rootstock, you can greatly improve it. And the one that has really proven uh, exceptionally good in our conditions, not only for the soils, but also just for our climate, is known as Fortuniana. It's an old hybrid of Rosa levigata by Rosa Banksy. Uh, it was brought from China. It's probably it's an ancient hy hybrid. And um, really has kind of, have, of uh, uh, revolutionized our ability to grow good roses. It was first tried out as a, as a rootstock in early 20th century Australia in the Western Australia, which has a climate somewhat similar to ours. And then by the 1920s, it was being used in Florida to, to a small degree. The Glen St. Mary Nursery up near Jacksonville uh, was the first commercial company in the US to offer roses on it. And it is highly tolerant of heat. It likes sandy soils. It, it, it is quite tolerant of soil-borne diseases and nematodes. And so it's really a, a much more carefree root system. So that allows us to grow a lot of roses that really wouldn't do well here otherwise. And we in our gardens do graft pretty much all of our roses under Fortuniana. One of the challenges we have is that there are not very many nurseries in Florida that uh, produce such roses. There is uh, Nelson's roses in the Apopka area. There is cool roses down in Palm Beach County. 
Um, but really, you're, you're pretty limited on where you can buy Virginiana rooted roses in the state. Some garden centers will have them. I know here in Lakeland, Peterson's orders them in. I think they're bringing them from some other state, but they are in Virginiana. Plants grafted to Fertuniana often produce a very large plant. It'll make more flowers than an own root plant of the same variety. But if the catalog or description of a variety says it grows three feet tall, you probably ought to figure it'll grow five feet tall or add, add two thirds to twice the, the uh, uh, size that the descriptions say, just because Fertuniana will cause a plant to get bigger. This is uh, a rose in our garden. These are what you're looking at here are six plants two here, two here, two here. Hopefully you can see my cursor moving. So these four on the right are grafted to Fertuniana. These two are rooted cuttings. So they're on their own roots, perfectly healthy, but notice they're only about half as high. And something you can't see as clearly there, but if I point it out, maybe you'll notice it. Think about how many flowers, you can kind of see the spent flowers and the buds there, even though there are not a lot of, a lot of open ones. I, I'm getting, more than twice as many flowers on this plant at any given time than I am on this plant. So I find that a big advantage to using a Fertuniana rooted rose. As far as varieties that do well, uh, uh, there have been some that we've found are failures. And, and I don't know if Jamie's introduction said this, but I've always had a great interest in the, the antique rose varieties as opposed to the modern ones. So my collection is very much older heritage rose oriented as opposed to modern roses. So things we've tried that have been failures, um, probably more due to a lack of cold in the winter rather than high summer temperatures. Most roses can handle high temperature in the summer as long as you cool them off later. But we spend so little time cool enough uh, that, that that kind of ruins the ability to grow some roses. Uh, some of them may grow just fine, but they don't flower because they need a winter to trigger the flowering response. So most of the so-called moss roses that make these little glandular hairs on them, which is quite pretty and it smells good like Christmas trees, most of those don't do well for us here. Um, the old gallicas, this is the this is the red rose of Lancaster from the English War, Wars of the Roses. That's a whole class of old European roses that that's one of the groups that will grow just fine. They, they're perfectly healthy but we've had some of them in the garden for as much as four and a half years and not got a single flower the whole time. And so we finally dug them up. The Albas, this is the White Rose of York from the Wars of the Roses. So these are another, another ancient class of European roses. Um, grows just fine. If I get two flowers per year off of a seven foot tall bush, I figure I've done well. Most years it doesn't bloom at all. So again, I do not recommend that. Most of the species roses and also hybrids that only bloom in the spring or early summer up north and then stop. Uh, most of those don't bloom here ever. On the other hand, we've had some great successes. And so among the species and near species, species being the wild roses, we have one native rose here in central Florida, uh, Rosa palustris, the swamp rose. Uh, this is a plant uh, in the pictures that I actually co collected up in Sumter County, so kind of west of where you all are in the green swamp, and it does quite well. Uh, most swamp roses uh, are said to bloom only once a year, but this one actually repeats really well for us. If you're looking in a catalog or a nursery somewhere and they have what they call swamp roses, the thing that's often sold that way is double. It'll have 10 to 15 petals, and it is almost virtually thornless and it is a climber. And that one does not do as well for us. It only blooms once a year. This one is single. It has absolutely vicious thorns and it's a moderate sized bush, never climbs. So it's a very different looking thing. I think that climber that they sell is probably a hybrid of the swamp rose, but it's marketed as the swamp rose. Then there's the autumn damask rose. This is probably the oldest rose in cultivation. Uh, the, the poet Virgil wrote about it in the year 14 BC, so it's really ancient. It's also one of the roses used to make really good rose perfume, and it does wonderfully well for us. The chestnut rose, Roserox bergii, comes in a single and a double form. This is one that's completely black spot proof. The double one reblooms very well. The single one, you usually just get a big flush of flowers in the spring. 
but it's a very pretty bush. It has these very um, uh, ferny looking leaves that, as I say, they're really disease resistant. So that's a great rose. The Cherokee rose, which is the state flower of the state of Georgia, and the Georgia Constitution says it is their native rose. Um, whoever wrote that didn't know their horticulture or their botanic history. It is from China, and we actually know who brought it to Georgia and, and when. So um, they made that up. But it is a good rose. It is a climber, only blooms in the spring, but smells wonderful. It's another one that's really totally carefree. If you have a big old tree or a garage you'd like to just cover with a gigantic rose, this will do it. The Lady Banks Rose, another Chinese variety that is um, uh, fragrant. And this one is completely thornless. For us, we don't get heavy bloom. It, it, it's strictly once blooming in the sp spring. We don't get heavy bloom on it. I have friends near Gainesville who do. So just that little bit of moving north from us, they get enough more chilly days than we do that it does well. So depending on whether you live in kind of a cold spot or a warm spot, uh, uh, you may or may not do really well with the Lady Banks Rose. Totally disease resistant also and carefree, but strictly once blooming. Then there's the, there are the roses that we call the musk roses, Rosa Moschata. Shakespeare wrote about this, um, and it comes in a single, a double, and a very double form known as the temple musk. Has just an amazing fragrance, kind of like roses mixed with cloves. And it's my favorite rose, I think, if I had to pick one. I, I really like it. I live in a, a college-owned rental house down the hill from my rose garden, probably 200 yards away. And on a very still, foggy morning, I can walk out my front door and I can tell if the musk roses are blooming up in the garden because the fragrance carries that far. I, I know of no other rose, no other flower that can do that. This is a musk rose in the garden. The rugosas, if you're from New England, you may be familiar with them growing on the beach. Um, and so they're very cold tolerant, very salt tolerant. It's kind of a surprise that they would like Florida, that this is such a different climate for them. And they don't like it here if you grow them on their own roots. But if you graft them to Fortuniana, they can do quite well. And they're also almost completely disease resistant, although some of them do have some chili thrips problem. Uh, this is a hybrid spinosissima, sustainable perpetual that does well for us. Uh, its ancestors are native to the north coasts of Scotland. So again, climate wise, it shouldn't like us, but it does. The so-called China roses are hybrids of Rosa chinensis, which comes from China. They're quite disease resistant. They do very well on their own roots. So if you want to root your own from cuttings, this is a group that would do well that way. They love our climate. They, they do well in heat. They don't need a winter. They bloom all the time. They don't get black spot. Some of them do get chili thrips, but I think they're a little better about it than most roses. So. Uh, Louis Philippe in the middle, sometimes known as the Florida Cracker Rose, is uh, uh, kind of uh, symbolic of old Florida. Uh, and lots of people have it growing in their backyard, old homesteads. And then Archduke Charles opens up pink and turns red over time. Mutabilis, you, it's hard to see in this picture, but that plant is probably 10 feet across by eight feet tall. It grows really large. And it's sometimes known as the butterfly rose. Um, it, it opens up yellow and then turns orange and then turns pink and then it turns red and you've got all those different colors on the flower at the plant at the same time. And then pink pet, also known as Caldwell pink, is another very carefree, low maintenance one that we can do quite nicely with. The next group then are tea roses. Notice that these are not hybrid teas. A lot of people in the deep south refer to hybrid teas as tea roses. And they're two completely different groups of roses. The hybrid teas are distant descendants of the teas, but they're not teas anymore. So the tea roses are perhaps the best class of all for our climate. If you're looking for an antique looking rose, they grow to be big bushes. They're always in flower. They make fairly large flowers for an old fashioned rose. They are often quite disease resistant, although they're also often susceptible to um, thrips. Uh, some of them do okay on their own roots, especially if you have some clay in your soil, but I really prefer to graft them on Fortuniana. 
So Mrs. B. R. Kant may be the best T rose that I know of. This is it grows quite large. When I came to Florida Southern in the 80s, there was a plant of this rose that we had a picture of the same rose on the plant in 1953, bigger than it was when I saw it in the 80s. And then that plant remained on campus until 2004. And we got a new president who decided it didn't look good and had it cut down. So that plant lived a long time. The only care it got was that once in a while someone would think it looked bad and come through with a hedge trimmer and just kind of hack it back to a stump. As far as I know, it never received a drop of irrigation water, was never fertilized, and it was just fine. Um, so that's one I recommend highly. Uh, and then this is a closer picture of it. Uh, and then some others that, that do well for us. Uh, Mrs. B.R. Cant grows quite large. So does Monsieur Tillier. That's a very large growing rose. And then Lady Hillingdon, somewhat smaller, and, and Rosette de Lisi. But they're still, it's, it's a large bushed rose compared to other roses. Then we have the so-called noisettes and tea noisettes. The noisettes originated in Charleston, South Carolina, and they're often quite disease resistant, often heat tolerant, nearly constant flowering, and some of them are climbers. So Champney's pink cluster on the left and blush noisette on the right. If you like cluster flowers of small roses, this would be a good group to grow. And then they were hybridized with the tea roses to make what we call the tea noisettes. Crepuscule is surely one of the best climbing roses we grow. It's this nice kind of brownish caramelly apricot color. Blooms all the time, disease proof. Um, not too bad for chili thrips, although I would still treat them if, if I were growing it, uh, but still it's a great rose. And then Marshall Neal, perhaps the most famous rose of the post-Civil War South. It was introduced, I think in 1866. And at one point, everybody's grandmother had to have one in her garden or she wasn't a real gardener. Very, very vigorous climber. Uh, it's noted for being picky and hard to grow, unless you put it on Fortuniana roots, at which point it will take over your lawn. So you kind of plant it and then run for your life because it, it gets big, but it's a great rose. The polyanthas are, will do well with very little care. They're off, also often disease resistant. They make big clusters of tiny flowers and some of them do okay on their own roots. So this is, Cecile Bruner, it also comes in a form known as spray Cecile Bruner that makes bigger clusters of flowers. Uh, very carefree, that's a good one I recommend if you want a really uh, no maintenance type of rose. Those flowers are about an inch and a half across, they're, they're small. This is Leonie Lamesh, one you don't often see, but we, one that we like in our garden. As we move toward the, the modern hybrids, then we have the hybrid perpetuals and damask perpetuals. And these are the other ancestors of our modern hybrid teas besides the teas. So they are big, uh, big plants, big flowers. Some of them do well, but some of them don't flower very often or are spring flowering only. So you have to be kind of picky what varieties you pick. But if you like the look of an old fashioned grandmother's rose, this, this group would give that to you. Most of them are pretty susceptible to black spots, so you would have to spray them. Um, but if you do spray your garden, they're, they're nice and they do well. Very much improved by grafting them to Fortuniana roots, and I don't think I'd want to grow them in Lakeland any other way. Uh, three favorites of mine are Marchesa Bocella, also known as Jacques Cartier, and then Paul Neron, one of the biggest roses we grow on a, on a good cool day. That can be six or seven inches across. And then Rendell Violette, which is a bluish purple, one of the most blue of the roses that are available. Uh, bourbons, there are lots of different types of bourbons and a lot of them don't repeat very well. And the only ones I would recommend for Florida are the ones that are known to repeat really well. So Souvenir de la Malmaison is one of the most famous old roses. It then mutated to several other forms so this is Souvenir de Saint Anne's, one of its mutant forms. And, and that, that, those roses do quite well. And then Maggie is a bourbon. Maggie's a rose that we really don't know its original name. It was called Maggie by Dr. Bill Welsh because he found it growing in the backyard of his mother-in-law's mother house uh, in Louisiana and her name was Maggie. So he named it that. But in India, they grow the same rose as Kakinata Red in Bermuda, they grow the same rose as Pacific Rose. 
Uh, and then I have seen it in Myanmar, which is the same as Burma and Bangladesh, just growing out in people's gardens. I was in Bangladesh working on a volunteer consulting project. And obviously I didn't know anybody there. I'd never been there before. And we went to a restaurant and I said to my translator, give me a minute, I gotta go see an old friend here across the parking lot. And he thought I was losing it or something. And well, the old friend was Maggie. It was in full bloom at the far end of this parking lot. So it's a, a rose that I find throughout the tropical world and it does wonderfully well for it. This is it in our garden uh, as growing as a hedge. That's about eight plants and just a great rose. That's, that's another one I would recommend super highly. Well, then we have the modern hybrids. Uh, they do often require regular spraying against particularly black spot and chili thrips uh, if you're gonna grow them, but some of them can do real well. Most of them do much better on Fortuniana than they would on their own roots or on some other grafted root stock. And so some of the ones we grow, even among the hybrid teas, I don't tend to grow the brand new ones. I tend to grow the tried and true classics. So Mr. Lincoln, Oklahoma, Fragrant Cloud, Peace, Tiffany. We also have uh, John F. Kennedy and Dolly Parton in our garden. Those are all good roses. They do very well for us. But I think if I were trying to grow a non-sprayed garden, I don't know that I would even try any of these except perhaps Mr. Lincoln. I did grow it in my yard for a while, for several years without spraying it, and it was okay. The others, I, I think you would be challenged to grow without spraying them for, for black spot. And then there are some modern shrubs that aren't really hybrid teas, but they have kind of that look. So there's Belinda's Dream, the one I mentioned that is absolutely disease proof, but does have to be protected from thrips. And then there's a whole series of roses by David Austin, known as the Austin Roses or the English Roses. And this is an example of, of his, Graham Thomas. Some of the Austin Roses would be an exception to my recommendation to using Fortuniana. When I put Graham Thomas on Fortuniana roots, I get an astonishingly large rose bush. It'll almost turn into a tree and I do well to get one or two flowers off of it the whole year. It wants to put all it's got into growing leaves and stems. And so I tend to grow it on its own roots as a rooted cutting. And um, it dies out after a few years, but it grows and blooms well while I'm growing it. And then, and that's true of some of the other English roses. They're not very good at reblooming re for us, especially on Fortuniana. But Colonial Days was actually bred here in Florida by a friend of mine, Diane Giles from some of Austin's roses. And this is a great one for us. It blooms all the time, dark red. The only thing I would say that's not perfect about that rose is it is a red rose that does not, not have a smell. And red roses, we believe they ought to smell good in every case, that one doesn't, but it's a great rose anyway. We also have some special collections on campus. As, as Jamie mentioned in the introduction, we have a collection from Bermuda which is out in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and uh, a lot of people think it's in the Caribbean, but it's really north of the Bahamas quite a long way. Um, these are probably mostly Chinas and Teas with a few bourbons and noisettes. They may be historic varieties and they forgot the names of, or they may be seedlings that occurred, occurred in Bermuda. But in any case, they're highly disease resistant. They're tolerant of poor alkaline, salty soils. Uh, there's no place you can go in Bermuda that's more than a mile and a half from seawater. So, they get salt spray, they get hurricanes, and these roses are survivors and, and they do quite well for us. So these are some of the ones that we grow in our gardens. Um, and um, Belfield's an interesting one. It is hypothesized that it may be the original Slater's Crimson China. And if it is, the genetics for red in that rose are what all modern red roses use as their source of red today. We don't know for sure that Belfield is Slater's, but a lot of people think that it is. And then Smith's Parish, which is one of the Bermuda roses, has this interesting habit of being usually white. Sometimes it makes a red stripe or two. Sometimes it makes some pink. Sometimes you get a solid pink or solid red rose. And so uh, it's, it's thought to have been the original Fortune's five color rose. But this is the one that I was saying at the very beginning is the only truly resistant rose I know of to chili thrips. It also hardly ever shows any black spot or mildew. So if you want a rose that just has no pest or disease problems, this is the one rose in all, all roses that I could really recommend in that way. 
We have a whole hedge of it here. We have alt alternated the pink and red form of it with the white form. It, on the white form, once in a while, it'll make an all red flower. And if you make a cutting from right under that flower, then you can get a plant that stays pink or red. And that one gets called red Smith's parish, whereas the regular one is just called Smith's parish. Uh, we also grow a collection of roses bred by M.S. Piratagavan, who is from Southern India. And um, uh, he uses Indian hot weather species and high humidity species to breed disease resistance and heat tolerance into his roses. And so we're trialing his roses. And some of them do really well for us. This is coffee country, um, which in cool weather can look, look almost the color of a cup of coffee with cream in it. Uh, in hotter weather, it will be more pink. Uh, Helga's Quest, they named one in my honor. I was really honored and it's called Dr. Malcolm Manners. On a hot day, it's a nice pink rose. On a chilly day, it also develops some greenish brown shades to it. Emina is one that I think could be a substitute for knockout. It's brilliantly colored. It's ridiculously disease resistant and just a great rose. And then Faith Whittlesey, that's the one I showed you early on, the picture of the grafted and ungrafted ones on the, the rootstock effect. Uh, creamy white blooms all the time. It's also one of their better roses, I think. And Twilight Trist, which is purple and extremely fragrant. Lotus Born, a smaller pink fragrant rose. And Kindly Light, this is a very tall growing hybrid tea type. These are not readily available. Um, some of the roses in North Florida are starting to sell them. Um, uh, uh, Rose Petals Nursery in Archer and Angel Gardens in um, Alachua and uh, a reverence for, for roses over closer to Inverness. Um, they may have some of these, but they're kind of hard to find. Okay, so that's just kind of an introduction to the roses that we grow. Let's talk a little bit about how we grow them. Um, we produce our own plants almost always. Uh, we rear our own cuttings, uh, either a Fortuniana that we're going to graft onto, or if we're going to grow them on root, we do that under intermittent mist. So this is a, a Fortuniana cutting. I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly, but at the end I've got, and I think Jamie also has either sent you or will be sending you a handout of links to some YouTube videos where I go through a complete tutorial of how we do these, but I've got some stills to show you right now. So cuttings there, four to six inches tall with a few leaves on them. Uh, we tend to just leave a few leaves at the top. I like to wound the base. We dip that then in our rooting hormone and pot them up in, in little two inch pots. And here we're using a powdered hormone. I use sometimes use dip and grow liquids. I sometimes use hormidin. Uh, either one works fine. Roses are pretty easy to root. This is our mist bed that we have at the college. It is a, an open box made of fiberglass. And then we have sliding glass shower doors on the front. And it, we control it with an electric solenoid valve. This is the mist bed that sprays a fine mist of water down over the cuttings. We have a clock system where it comes on around eight in the morning. It goes off around eight in the evening. Uh, so we're, we're spraying during the day. We're not spraying at night. That clock powers this clock, which is a 10 minute circulating clock and we've got two pins in it. So it actually sprays for six or seven seconds every five minutes. And then the rest of the five minutes, it's not spraying. So my idea is to keep those cuttings damp, but not really dripping wet. So these are cuttings in the mist. And after about three weeks, they make roots. You could see them coming out the bottom and those are ready then to come out of the mist. That's how we root all of our cuttings. Um, on one of my volunteer consulting trips in Angola, I was showing them how to do, do this without a mist bed and realizing many of you don't have a mist bed, you may already know this about rooting cuttings, but you can just cut off a plastic Coke bottle or drinking water bottle or whatever and turn it upside down over your cutting to make a little high humidity greenhouse and you can root cuttings that way. That works pretty well. We usually graft either by cleft grafting or by chip budding. So for a cleft graft, this is my cyan variety on the left. That's the variety that's gonna make my roses. This is my Fortuniana cutting I'm going to put it on. 
And so on my scion, I cut a very sharp V-shaped wedge at the bottom of the cutting. And then in my Fortuniana, I just make a crack down the middle with my grafting knife and then push that wedge into the cleft in the Fortuniana and then wrap that up either with a plastic, uh, plastic uh, uh, strip or a rubber band. I usually use rubber bands. And then wound the base of the cutting and dip it in hormone like you would any other cutting and pot that up. And that goes in the mist bed, just like a regular cutting to root. And by the time the Fortuniana makes roots down here, it will also be healing that graft up above. So these are some in the mist. You can see they're starting to make shoots in the top. We usually leave these in the mist until they've got good growth coming out the top that tells us we have a good sturdy graft union there. The other method is if you have rooted cuttings of Fortuniana, then you can bud uh, the, your, your cyan variety onto that and you don't need mist for that as long as you already have the rooted cuttings. So this is the rootstock. I'm cutting a little chip of bark out of the side. This is my cyan variety, the hybrid tea or whatever I want to grow with a bud. I cut a shield the same size and shape as that hole I made in the rootstock. It has to have a bud on it. And then I insert my cyan variety into my rootstock and seal that up and leave it wrapped for three to four weeks and then unwrap it. And there's my new little plant coming out. So those are the two methods we use for grafting our roses. Then we grow them on in the greenhouse, usually in one or two gallon pots until they're big enough to go in the gardens. The extra we end up selling and the funds that we get for that help to fund our program. And then also uh, in years where there isn't any COVID, I often take a group of students to Harlem in New York City where we work in some of their municipal rose gardens and clean them up and prune them. And that's kind of fun, good, good way to get my students out on a service learning project. We, as I said early on, we use our rose gardens as a teaching tool. So repotting and planting in the garden and pruning and all of the other things we do, we tend to use students for that. When we plant a rose in the garden, I like to put a great big planting hole. And so I have this joke, I put a ha there. I, I say the rose, the, the, the hole has to be exactly 23 and a half inches wide and 18 inches deep. And I try to say that very sternly so people will believe me. And then I point out that's, that's ridiculous nonsense. The reason I came up with those numbers is that I just stand with my elbows hanging at my sides and hold my hands out straight in front of me. And if you measure that distance between my hands, that happens to be 23 and a half inches. And if I jump into the hole as I'm digging it, if it comes up to the bottom of my kneecaps, that happens to be 18 inches. So what I'm really doing is drilling, a, d digging a hole as wide as my shoulders and as high as my kneecaps. Uh, any other size or shape could do just as well, but th that's the hole I dig. I then fill that with an organic potting media or compost. We if we're using potting mix, we use a 2.8 cubic foot bag. That's about 20 gallons of soil. And we add uh, slow release uh, micronutrients and, and NPK slow release at the time we plant and then we uh, water it in and, and we plant, we, we flood that hole. So we're really planting the plant underwater to get rid of water, air bubbles. And then we tie them up to a sturdy stake. One of the disadvantages of Fortuniana is it's physically very weak. And so you have to use a good sturdy stake to tie the plant for the entire lifetime of the plant. It never outgrows that. And we have micro sprinklers in the rose garden that, that uh, water them. We mulch usually with three or four inches of pine straw. I like pine straw. I have used oak leaves. I've used pine uh, bark. Those are all fine. Other kinds of mulch would be fine too, but I happen to like pine straw. Uh, here we are planting and staking some roses in the garden. And you can kind of get a sense of scale there of how big those planting holes are. And again, there's a video tutorial that you'll have a link to if you want to watch how, how we actually do that. Uh, pruning, we, we prune hard in the spring, usually in February, we, we're getting started now, and we cut them back pretty short compared to what's often recommended. Uh, we have students, volunteers from Rose Societies, Master Gardeners, and, and garden clubs that come and help. We can't do that this year because of COVID. Um, and then other times of the year, we just do a light deadheading as we need to keep them out of the paths. So this is one of my volunteer groups a couple years ago. You may recognize some of those people. 
Um, and here we are pruning in the garden. You can see we take them down, some of them to knee high, and most of them no more than waist high. I also have a, a, a tutorial video on how we do this, if that interests you. And a, a class of students pruning in the Jenkins garden. Fertilizers, we, we fertilize in the spring. We tend to use a slow release, something like 16, 8, 12 or similar. I usually use uh, Osmocode, but I've also used Harold's Polyon. Uh, and then uh, we also supplement that with some malorganite and some uh, magnesium sulfate. And then in the uh, late summer or autumn, we tend to supplement with a little bit of milorganite and sulfate of potash magnesia. But that's really all the fertilizing we do. I think I could use more. I think my garden sometimes is a little hungry, but that's what we actually do. And again, the handout that Jamie is emailing you has actual recipes for what we've been using. Here again, using some student labor to put those materials out. Our gardens are sprayed weekly by a professional spray company for fungus diseases, and they'll add an insecticide for chili thrips when it's needed. And then these are the video tu tutorials, but you'll have the emailed word copy, which is probably going to be easy to, easier to use those links from. And with that, I will shut up and let you ask questions if you have any. Thank you, Malcolm. We've um, got a couple of questions. Number one is where can they buy these roses? Um, followed closely by, do you guys have a plant sale? Okay, uh, for some of these old fashioned roses, you have to go to an old fashioned rose nursery. And so, uh, and I don't know which of these are even open to the public with COVID, but they all do mail orders. So. Uh, and, and you can look them up online. In the Archer area, which is just kind of southwest of Gainesville, um, there is Rose Petals Nursery. Very good people, I recommend them. And then over near Inverness, I don't think they're in Inverness, but over that way is another company called A Reverence for Roses, and they're quite good. Uh, and then in Alachua, there is Angel Gardens. Now, all three of those have a nice selection of the old fashioned types. They tend to grow them all on their own roots. They won't be on Fortuniana, so that's a challenge. If you want Fortuniana rooted roses, there is a very old company in the Apopka area, O.F. Nelson and Sons, and most people just call them Nelson's roses. So you can get hybrid teas from them, but they don't have a lot of old roses. And then down in Palm Beach County, there is Cool Roses which grows some old roses, some modern roses. Getting old roses on Fortuniana is a challenge unless you do your own grafting, which is one reason we do our own. Out of state, one of the best mail order companies I know of is Antique Rose Emporium, which is in Brenham, Texas. And they, they sell a beautiful rose, again, on their own roots, but an amazing selection of some of these antique varieties. Um, in, in at Florida Southern, we do have in a non-COVID year, we tend to have a spring rose sale. And then the Central Florida Heritage Rose Society meets once a month here in Lakeland, sometimes on our campus, sometimes in a local church when they're meeting in person. And uh, often we'll have a small rose sale, rose sale in conjunction with one of their meetings. The campus is technically closed to anything like that through at least May, and then they may revise that and stretch it longer depending on the COVID situation. So we're not doing a sale this year. But um, in that sense, I would say we are the only source of a lot of these old varieties on Fortuniana roots. I'm sorry that's the case. I wish someone else would take that up and make it happen commercially, but it has not happened. So those are the places we tend to get our roses. Um, and, and again, a garden center in your area may be able to order them on Fortuniana for you. So like here in Lakeland, Peterson's Garden Center has them on Dr. Huey, which is the common California used rootstock, but they also carry some of their roses on Fortuniana. And if you ask, they're happy to tell you which are which. Thanks. Um, so we have a, a question, kind of a comment from Loretta. She got a miniature rose a week ago and it, the leaves are starting to turn yellow. Do you have any ideas what might be the issue there? Oh, there are a lot of them. Without seeing it, that's going to be hard to, to say. Um, 
if you got it in one of those foil or plastic sleeves that covers the pot, and if it's sitting in a pool of water, it may be water damage. And when I see a rose with yellow leaves at Lowe's or Home Depot, I can almost guarantee that's what's going on. They're drowning the thing. Um, if it got too dry and then was watered again, sometimes the, the wilting will, will go away, but the leaves will then turn yellow. It's possible that it has some sort of a root rotting fungus. It's possible that it was originally growing in the shade and now you're growing it in brighter light than it was used to. There are so many things that can cause that. Um, she says it was sitting in a container that maybe have been a bit wet. So if it's really wet, you may be able to save it, uh, let it drain well, see if it'll, don't let it dry so much that it wilts, but let it get close to dry before you water it and, and um, hopefully it'll come back. It may lose those leaves, but as long as the stem stays green, it may come right back for you with new growth. All right, now I've got a couple of people raising their hands. If you could write your question in the chat because we won't be able to hear you, um, then I'll be able to get those answered. So next, we've got one from um, Suntia. What do you do when roses have rose hips? Should I cut them off? Can they be planted? Totally up to you. There are some varieties that if you leave them on, the plant doesn't come right back and bloom again. So if your goal is a lot of flowers year round, then there is some advantage in clipping them off as soon as the petals fall before they get to, to produce hips. On the other hand, right now in our garden, some of our prettiest plants are the ones that we left the hips on. And so they're covered with these bright orange or red cherry sized fruit, which is kind of nice looking. It's, it, they're not rose flowers, but they're pretty. So, and if you want to eat them, of course, or make rose jelly or something like that, then you need to let them ripen. But just be aware, if you leave them on the plant, it's not going to hurt the plant, but you may not get a good rebloom until they're removed. And for that reason, a lot of people do remove them. Yeah, um, she's, uh, well, they've added that it's specifically in relation to knock out rose hips, if that changes anything. Knockout's one that will make more flowers even with the hips. But even there, you would get more flowers because the individual stem that the, the hip is on won't tend to sprout out and make new flowers until that hip ripens, which is several months. The, the reason a knockout keeps blooming is it has other stems in between those that are blooming. So if you want to ma maximize your blooms, even there, I would remove them. You ask, I, I think one of the things at the end of that first question was, should you plant them? They do have roses, in, they do have seeds inside. Um, Roses are not easy to grow from seeds in Florida because uh, even though they grow well here, the plants grow well here, they really are northern winter oriented plants and they're forgiving us by growing here. But the seeds require a winter. So when we plant seeds and we do plant quite a lot of seeds, we uh, wrap them up in a damp paper towel, we put them in a Ziploc bag, put them in a vegetable bin of the refrigerator and leave them there for three or four months. Because what you're doing is you're simulating the chilly soil of a northern winter. You, you don't want to freeze them. That may not hurt them, but it doesn't help either. You want them just cold but not frozen. And then three or four months later, you take them out and plant them, and then they grow just fine. But if you don't do that, they won't grow in Florida. And, and realize that if you plant a, a seed out of a certain rose, just as, as you don't look like your parents and your kids don't look exactly like you, every rose seedling is a new individual. So if you plant a seed out of your knockout rose, you might get a nice rose, but it won't be knockout anymore. And it may or may not have that disease resistant, the, the resistance that knockout has. So, I mean, you might luck out, but don't necessarily count on it. Thank you. Um, I do wanna just let everybody know that um, I did post the links in the chat. I'm still gonna email them to you, but in case any of you wanted that earlier, just um, scroll up a little bit. I also have the fertilizer program in there again, just so you have it now, I, I, I will be sending it. Um, so we have another question um, from Leslie. I have a rose, I've transplanted um, what I moved. She's moved several times with it. It's not thriving here. Could it be age or does it just not like Florida? It is over 20 years old. Again, hard to say for sure, not knowing what it is and whether it's grafted or whatever. Um, a lot of roses, if, if you're in an area, and I don't really know the soils in, in your county and you're not all from the same county, 
Um, if you're in an area that has some clay, then roses can live a long time in, even on their own roots or on Dr. Huey roots. But if you're in one of those very sandy oil or soil areas that so much of peninsular Florida is, um, if it's not in Fortuniana, they tend to peter out after five or six years and there's not much you can do about that. And that's my suspicion of what may be going on. You can help matters by using a lot of organic matter around it, use a good deep mulch. But even then at some point, plan to replace it. And if you want that particular rose, you might start a cutting of it and say you'll have a replacement. But um, unless it's on Fortuniana, I would not expect it to live for a lot of years, whether you've transplanted it or not. Thank you. And she does say it is in sandy soil. Okay. And um, Leslie, uh, she happens to be one of our Master Gardener volunteers here. So um, we could potentially take a couple of those cuttings and try to grow some of them here for you if you'd like, Leslie. All right. Do we have any other questions? It doesn't look like it. It's pretty quiet. We had a couple of hand rays, but they haven't posted um, any questions. So I just wanted to check Kay and Loretta, did we cover everything that you guys needed help with? Does everybody know how to do chat on Zoom? Maybe they're not finding that. Right, it's it's two to the left of where the raise hand feature was. All right. Well, it looks like everybody's okay. Yep, we're starting to get thank yous coming in. So, um, yeah. If, one more thing. Yes. Um, people always wonder about visiting our gardens and we are in our peak bloom near the end of November, usually right before Thanksgiving. And then the big bloom of the year is usually the first two weeks in April. Normally, I would invite you to hire a bus and bring your entire gang over. We would love for you to do that most years. As I said, this year, the campus is officially closed at least through May. So I asked our security people, what are you gonna do if visitors show up? And they said, well, if it's just a couple of visitors, not a gang of them, if they're wearing masks, if they're just walking through the gardens, not causing any problems, we're not going to throw them out. So while I'm not allowed to invite you, if, if, if you and your spouse and, uh, wanna come over someday and have a look, you could do that but we'll, we'll probably have to wait till at least November to really have formalized tours, which we would welcome at that point if you'd like to do it. All right, well, thank you. Uh, hopefully we can do that. And I've just got a quick, I, I should have a quick, yeah, I've got a really quick two question poll. If those of you still here can just click on that and answer it really, really quick. Um, and Eileen, the college is Florida Southern College. It's located in Lakeland, Florida. Um, I actually can give you the entire address. It's 111 Lake Hollingsworth Drive, Lakeland, Florida. And I don't have the zip code memorized anymore. If you uh, if you ever drive over and use a GPS, there's actually a fake address you can use. It'll get you if you use the 111 Lake Hollingsworth, it'll take you to the lake, but it doesn't take you to the parking lot. Let me see if I can find that address for you. That's a great trick. Yeah, I learned that from the testing office. I said, "How do you get people into this parking lot? Because it's so hard to tell them." Um, where it is. All right. Thanks so, for all of you that participated in the poll. I'm going to get that out of the way now. Um, and it looks like um, everybody learned something new and almost everybody plans on implementing something they learned. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. If you want to use GPS to find the best parking lot, it is 915 Frank Lloyd Wright Way. 915 Frank Lloyd Wright Way. And that will take you, Jamie, you know where this is. It takes you to that north entrance to the big lot by Ordway. So that's the perfect Okay, place. so it takes you up Johnson, right? It takes you up Johnson and then down Frank Lloyd Wright and you would enter that big lot that goes from Ordway around the library. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I did get one more question while we were in there. How do you recognize chili thrips? Uh, by the way, on your chat, Right, remember, is W-R-I-G-H-T. Oh my gosh, I can't even right now. <laughs> um, I'll fix it. Uh, chili thrips are much smaller than most flower thrips, so they're, they're kind of hard to see. Um, you, um, 
And Jamie, I don't know if your extension office has a, a thing on doing a tap test to see them on a white piece of paper, uh, but you can see the injury very well. And it's easiest to see it on leaves and stems. You get little black marks that, that especially on the stem, there's nothing else that causes that black staining like I showed early in the PowerPoint. Um, and, and you get little shriveled leaves. Um, it's pretty, pretty obvious. And, and you can uh, Google image search for chili thrips injury and see lots of pictures. Pictures yeah, and you can always bring samples into our extension office here in Tavares, and we can work on um, getting those identified. We do have an agent here that does, um, she does have a degree in entomology, so I tend to ask her for help as I learn to identify some of these things. Um, but yeah, chili thrips, there's a couple of different ways we can help identify those here. I, I thought of one other thing that we should say. Mm -hmm. In the Middle South, particularly Tennessee, Kentucky, parts of Alabama, Georgia, and over all the way into Texas, there is a horrendous, terrifying virus disease of roses called Rose Rosette. It's spread by a mite. It is not curable. It always results in the death of the rose, and we don't have it in Central Florida, and we don't want it in Central Florida. So I had a friend here in Lakeland whose aunt lives in Tennessee, who brought her a cutting of her favorite rose to grow in her backyard. And her friend asked me how to root it. And I said, I want you to go outside and build a bonfire and burn it now because you are endangering every rose in Florida. So be really careful if you or friends or relatives are bringing roses into the state from an area that has rose rosette. We really need to keep it out of here. All right, and we, that's really important. And we have one final question. Um, and I think you probably already gave the answer, but um, if you could only grow one rose in the garden, what would you recommend? I, I probably change that story from day to day, but I think my more often than not, I would say Mrs. B.R. Kant, the, the tea rose. That's the mm -hmm. one that was on our campus back in the 1950s. It, it does so well here. And yeah, I remember that's the one that it was there for a long time. That's one that you said left in 2004? Yeah. Yeah, that was there when I went to college there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I remember that one. All right, so we're just about hitting that seven o'clock time. So if we have no other questions, we're gonna say goodbye and thank you again, um, Dr. Manners. And just imagine that you've got, you know, about just over 30 people cheering and clapping for you. Um, you know, there might be a wave going on. They're very excited. Oh, well, thank you. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yes, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone.